My name is Dara Channings. I'm the director of ACT here in Bennington for the Alliance for Community Transformation. That's a mouthful, so we just say ACT Bennington. Um, we are a substance misuse prevention coalition, and we focus on the youth population. Primarily, we work with middle school students, um, but we also provide support for elementary school and high school as well. Um, collaboration is really at the heart of what we do. We believe that it takes a village when it comes to improving the health of our communities. Um, so we're really um, driven by that um, collaborative effort um, throughout our community and different organizations. Next slide. So a little bit of what we do is substance use education and outreach, suicide prevention and mental health, youth empowerment and engagement, and we offer community support. Now I do have a question for you. When you hear substance misuse prevention, what do you think of? Anyone? You mean like a failure? They have a lot of failure. You can imagine how confusing it gets sometimes for me. Yes, I hear that a lot. The DARE program or you know, the Just Say No era. Um, School assemblies with 250 kids in an auditorium being told how scary drugs are. Yeah, right. And, you know, time and data have shown us that that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, scared straight just isn't effective um, for substance misuse. Next slide. So when we think about what prevention looks like in the community, here are some examples of what prevention looks like. After school and third space programs, um, school and community connectedness, which is a lot of the work that we're doing, mentoring programs, mental health, treatment and recovery services, affordable housing, food and hygiene security, health and social equity, youth-friendly downtowns and outdoor spaces, and town health and wellness policies. These are just a few. Can you think of anything else that should be up there? Jonas, that's a pretty good list. <laughs> okay, next slide. So I wanted to share this quote by the psychologist Gordon Blatt. Um, Youth mattering and something called the developmental assets guides our work at ACT. Um, and mattering is the sense of being significant and valued by other people. People who believe they matter to others have a key protective resource that can buffer them from life stressors and challenges throughout their lives. Um, data shows us time and again that when kids feel connected to their school and to the community, they have better mental health outcomes, better coping skills, resiliency, and they are less likely to misuse substances. Don't know where we're on. Yeah. So, mattering matters. Right, and I'm going to give you a couple data points here, but um, the CDC um, just shared this great quote, approaches that promote help, seek help seeking behaviors, connections to trusted adults, supportive peers, community engagement activities have been shown to have many benefits, including improved feelings of connectedness. Again, better mental health, reduced risk for suicide, reduced prevalence of health risk behaviors, and better academic achievement. And we see this across the board. So the first two come from the 2019 Youth Risk Behavior Survey data. That is done every two years. It's a national survey um, for grades 6 through 12. Um, and it covers everything from engaging in risky behaviors to family supports to dinner with your family how many nights a week and that sort of thing. So 54% of high schoolers in Bennington County strongly agree or agree that they matter to our community. It's a lot lower for our LGBTQ students and often students of color. 35% um, of them in that survey agreed that they matter to the community. 57% um, of Mount Anthony Middle School students agree they matter to the community. So it's a little bit better. Um, we've been inching up. It was at 40% in 2015. So it's getting better, but we still have a lot of work to do. A lot of kids are really not feeling connected. Next slide. So I'm going to reference three surveys. I just um, shared about the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, the DFC Core Measures, 
which um, is a supplement to the Youth First Behavior Survey, and we work with our school partners to get that out to grades um, 6 through 12. Um, last year, we added questions around youth mental health and resiliency. It's typically just a survey about perceptions of risk of using substances um, in past 30 days. Um, but we said we need to know how our kids locally are faring during this pandemic. So we added some, some questions around that. This spring, we added questions about home life. So we're asking questions about, do you feel safe at home? Do you have access to food all the time? Do you need hygiene products, soap, shampoo, menstrual products, and things like that? Um, now I'm going to middle school already did the survey, and the high school's going to do it next week. So um, I'll make sure to email the data when we will finish with the analysis for part of the summer, and I'll make sure to share that with you. And then the last one, I'm including the Adolescent Behaviors and Experiences Survey. This was this just came out, um, and it's so relevant. Um, the CDC conducted this January through June of 2021 um, to measure pandemic-related impacts on adolescents, and that was grades 9 to 12. Next slide. So I'm going to share some data points from the 2021 Core Measure Survey. I do have some paper copies here if you want to take it home with you. Next slide. So mental health and suicidality. 45% of students felt anxious or worried most all or most of the time. 28% felt sad or hopeless all or most of the time. 19% hurt themselves on purpose. That's 73 students. 386 kids took the survey. 14% of those kids made a suicide plan, 54 students. And 6% made a suicide attempt. That is 23 students. If I hear one student making a suicide attempt, that is very serious and very great news to me. 23 students. Next slide. But we have some resiliency. 90% of students reported having a hobby they enjoy. That's great. 70% feel their teachers at school care about them. And that was kind of a tough question, right? Because they were basing their answers on the previous year. They were all the problem. 88% report having an adult at home that you go to for help. That's great. And 51% take lessons in art, music, dance, or other sports. So those are definite positives. So when we look at substance use, um, we're using the word cannabis here, we're trying to keep aligned with the state, um, but it's marijuana, and EVPs are electronic big products, so they will be ritual. Um, those are the most used substances in the past 30 days when the survey was conducted last spring. 55% of eighth graders report slight risk and no risk when using marijuana products. Um, we have been seeing this trend take upwards since legalization a few years ago, and now with retail sales on the horizon, um, we have some challenges ahead of us. Um, because that perception of harm is going down. Um, and perceptions of risk are similar between grades, with the exception of those cannabis products. And at the middle level, prescription drugs and cigarettes are perceived as um, highest risk and most likely to be disapproved of by parents and peers. So what do you mean by our highest risk? How, what does that mean you talking about when you say that? Um, so when, when a kid is met when we're measuring their perception of harm, right? So if I use alcohol, I think there's a high risk to my body. Or I think there's a low risk to my body. Sure. Anyone else on this slide? Okay. Um, so now I just wanted to turn over to this new age survey from the CDC. Um, I wasn't really surprised by this data given what we're seeing locally. Um, but it was really interesting because you can see, like in the second point here, among the 43 percent uh, of students who had ever drunk alcohol, 29.6 of them strongly agreed to drink more during the pandemic. Um, and the same thing with illicit drugs. 30%, over 30% said, hey, I used more. 
and substance misuse was more prevalent among students who attended in-person or hybrid model instruction, which I thought really interesting. Next slide. Um, so we're talking about mental health, and um, before I dive into this, I just as a reminder, there are significant differences in mental health responses by gender and sexual orientation. This is true for our local surveys. Um, males, male students, and students identifying as heterosexual are less likely to report poor mental health. So, um, more than one in three high school students in the survey experienced poor mental health during the pandemic. Nearly half of them felt persistently sad or hopeless. Um, and again, female students and those who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, other, or questioning are experiencing disproportionate levels of poor mental health and suicide um, ideations. Um, you know, it's, it's grim to look at, <laughs> um, but I think it's really important that we have those data points. Um, next slide. Another thing that is important to point out from this survey is that racism is a public health problem. Um, more than one third of all US high school students felt they've been treated unfairly at school because of their race and ethnicity. Um, Asian, black, and multiracial students reported the highest levels of experienced racism. We've actually seen that right here in our community. Uh, students who reported racism were also more likely to experience poor mental health outcomes and feel less connected. So this um, is about disruptions to home life during the pandemic. Um, like the impacts were broad, um, family economic impacts, hunger, and abuse in the home. Um, abuse in the home ticked up during the pandemic. Um, ten, it looks like more than 10% reported physical abuse in the home. And then students that identify as LGBTQ are more likely to report physical abuse, 20% reporting versus 10% of their heterosexual um, peers. And black students um, in this survey were more likely to report hunger, with nearly a third reporting that they don't have enough food in their home during the pandemic. So we're talking about that connectedness piece again, right? So there, this study found that the prevalence of mental health and suicidality was high across students of all sex sexual identity, orientation, racial, and ethnic groups. However, poor mental health, persistent feelings of sad or hopelessness, and suicidal thoughts and behaviors were less prevalent among those who felt close to people at school and were virtually connected with others during the pandemic. So I think that's really interesting. Um, and another um, kind of fun fact, it's actually not that fun, the prevalence of feeling close to persons at school is higher among male students and female students higher among white students than black, Hispanic, and Asian students, and higher among heterosexual students than your LGBTQ. Could you, could you just confirm, are we still talking about editing? This is a national survey. This is a national survey, okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, all 50 states took part. Is Bennington, do Bennington numbers trend close to these numbers? They do, and that's why I felt like it was really important to share. This data just came out last week. So I got really kind of like data nerdy about it, not <laughs> to share. Um, but it's, it's aligning with what we're seeing here. So I feel it's, it's significant. Um, and it helps us to understand that we're not alone here. It's not unique here. It is a national widespread problem. Our youth are in crisis. Next slide. So, um, one of the things that we work on is increasing protective factors. Okay, so what does that look like for kids? Again, after school programs, mentoring, having a supportive school climate, fostering healthy family relationships, mental health, support, food and hygiene security. We can't talk about substance misuse or mental health if kids are not getting basic needs met, right? Um, I will tell you that I had a sneak peek at this spring's data for the middle school. And about 30% of respondents reported not having regular access to basic things like a toothbrush, clean clothes, menstrual products. Um, and then towns can do a lot um, to help create friendly spaces and places. 
um, and that increases protective factors for kids as well. Um, oh, go back one second. I'm going to toot my own horn for a minute. These are a couple of things that we work on. So the Space Place um, was, it is an after school club that was created by our youth leadership students at the middle school. Um, and we were set to launch a week before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so those kids are in high school now, but we still wanted to honor them when we were able to finally do the club this year. So that's an, another safe place for kids to be after school. Um, with safe adults that they trust. So what is that? The Space Place is an after-school club that we run at Mount Anthony Union Middle School. Um, and kids can just come in and be. They can have a snack, they hang out, we listen to music, they play board games. If they want to do their homework, they can do that. A lot of kids don't want to go home after school, you know. Um, or maybe they just want a little extra time just hanging out. Um, and we provide that. Um, yes, clubs are back now at the, at the middle school. We're really happy. Um, the Sunshine Box Project is something that we um, actually are crowdfunding for now. But um, each month we, and this was another project from our students, um, we create these um, activity kits to take home. So like this month it was a, a grow kit. So there's seeds and dirt and, you know, little pots and things like that. And um, the Bennington Street Library gave us some great stuff for that. Um, giving them something that just make them feel a little bit special. Here's something I can take home. Here's an activity I can do. Um, and it's been really popular. We launched it last year. And then the Take Care Project is something that we're really proud of. Um, we are working to address um, um, menstrual and hygiene poverty in our community. Um, so this is an interactive map that lets people know different locations in the community where they can have access to those products for free. Um, and we're working to support our schools um, with those products as well. Okay. Any questions? Do you want Is transportation a barrier for students that want to stay after school or middle school? Huge. I just wrote a, a grant to try to get some bus funding. <laughs> yeah, it's huge. Because you consider, like, I mean, I have kids that come up and say, you know, Miss Dare, I'd love to hang out, but, you know, I'm in Woodford, <laughs> and I have to take the bus home. I have no way to get. So mm -hmm. it's a huge barrier to our community transportation. Any other questions? Yes? The, um, when you, the, the first part of your survey where you were showing, like, 50, only 50 plus percent of kids and sometimes a lot less that feel connected. Do you, does the survey also ask them why they don't and what would make them feel connected? Is that where you get these after school program ideas and things like that? So what we so, do with our kids is we want to hear from them, right? Like we can't get, we can't get too detailed in the surveys. We're just trying to get that basic information, right? Um, but then we take that data, and we actually work with the kids every year. Um, we fund a training program from um, the Centers of Health and Learning, and they come, or up for learning rather, and they come down, and they teach the kids how to analyze their own school data. And then from there, the kids identify strengths and concerns, and then they make a plan for how they want to address that within their school community. So we get a lot of... Um, we generate a lot of discussion around the why during that during those activities. Yes. I didn't see any emphasis on the, the vaping and smoking situation. In That's the a whole other presentation. <laughs> um, I will tell you that um, vaping is out of control. That's what I thought. <laughs> um, and it's funny because a few years ago, the perception with the kids is that everybody's doing it. But our data, like our 2017 data, was showing that actually really small percentages of the kids were trying vapes. But that attitude is, well, everyone else is doing it, so I don't vape. So we do a lot of work around norms and the actual data um, to show them that this isn't what you think the social norm is. This is really the amount of people that try vapes, it's like 6% or something in the middle school that year. But it's driving up. So that perception drives it up. Um, ease of access drives it up. 
And there was a national survey conducted a couple years ago that found that 50% of kids that use vapes don't know there's nicotine in there. Um, our school nurses are seeing kids coming in presenting with nicotine addiction. They're sweating, they're jittery, because they take so much in all the time, and then when they don't have it, they're having nicotine withdrawal symptoms and they don't know what's going on with their bodies. It's pretty wild. Um, cigarette use is at an all-time low, um, and that's been trending down, down, down for years because of all of the work that we've done the last 20 and 30 years, right? Um, so now, you know, you have your big tobacco companies coming through and saying, well, we need replacement smokers, so let's try vapes. They need those kids. So, um, you know, and getting kids to understand the brain science, too. I mean, this is what substances do to your, your brain. Your brain's still developing, guys. You know? Yeah. Um, it seemed to me a bit of a disconnect between the question where 88 or something like that percent of kids said they had somebody at home they could trust and talk to, mm -hmm. and then the other survey said that well over 50% of them at home felt that there was some emotional and or physical abuse. Yes, yeah, so are they two different surveys? Those are the two different surveys. So the second part was the newer CDC survey for grades 9 to 12. Um, that, that first piece was from our middle school data. So you think our middle school data wouldn't show that 50 plus percent feel like there's emotional abuse at home? I don't think 50 okay. percent, which is a relief, right? Yeah. There's, there's a host of other issues going on, but um, yeah. Any, any other questions? Yeah. There's a, a yeah. puzzle of an act itself. And mm -hmm. Who yeah. are our around? What else you work on? How you get funded? Who's involved? All that stuff. So, ACT started as a tobacco coalition in 1996, and it lived under the um, SBMC umbrella. And it went through um, some evolution over the years, and then I think around 2011, 2012, um, the name was changed because the, or, um, the leaders at the time, the board decided, you know, we need to be focusing on more than just tobacco. Um, so they sort of rebranded as the Alliance for Community Transformations. In the fall of 2015, we received a federal drug-free communities grant, um, which is a five-year grant, um, which requires a coalition model. So we have representation across 12 different community sectors that come to our table. Um, and then, um, Last year, you know, the year before, we applied for a second and final five years and were granted that. It's $125,000 a year. We have to match that with in kind, which is always really fun and sometimes challenging. Um, and we focus on um, tobacco, nicotine, cannabis, and alcohol. And we also do some work around um, prescription drugs and opioids. Um, that was sort of really brief. Um, we do a lot of like on the ground, interactive, hands on with the kids. Um, but then, you know, we sit at a lot of meetings and we um, are stakeholders with the Bennington Opioid Response Team, uh, Hunger Council, right? Um, at the state level, we do a lot of work around Act 164, which is the cannabis uh, retail legislation. Um, we're part of Prevention Works Vermont, which is um, an organization that represents coalitions across the entire state of Vermont. Um, so, I mean, I can get you a list, it's pretty long. Um, that's all the boring stuff. Yeah. I'd rather be in a classroom all day with the kids and not behind the computer, but this is, this is what it is. Um, our, we are in year seven of that DFC, that second DFC, so um, we have a few more years to go. Um, and you know, it, it's really hard in Vermont. In Vermont. We're all a nonprofit, it feels like. Um, Vermont is the highest um, per capita uh, in the country for nonprofits. And we're all working on really similar goals and shared goals uh, around our healthy communities and around our kids. And we're competing for these dollars. Like the state doesn't give us money, right? So 
it can be really challenging. And how did you, if I remember correctly, did you work at Second Chance Animal Shelter before that? I did. Okay. I did. Some kids still would call me the animal lady. I just can't <laughs> shake it. Um, so I taught humane education for many, many years with Second Chance Animal Center. Um, and I primarily worked with um, elementary school. So going um, middle school was their own. <laughs> it's a really interesting place. It's in their own universe. Um, so I was a volunteer with the organization with ACT um, for several years. I did youth engagement. And then the directorship came open and here I am. And that was January 2018. Yeah. So sorry to ask so many questions, but um, what can an organization like Rotary do to help? That's a great question. I was so pleased to hear that you're going to be at Healthy Kids Day. Um, that's we're, we're so excited. We're going to take part in it as well because it's really the kickoff for Youth Appreciation Month, which is the month of May in Vermont. I don't know if you're aware of that. Um, Youth Appreciation Month started with ACT and some kids at the then CDC here in town. Um, and in 2016, we got a proclamation from then Governor Shumlin. And so we're really trying to get the community like invested. Like, this is Youth Appreciation Month. What can we do to show our kids that they matter, right? Going back to that youth mattering. Um, and I can send you all of the links. Michael, I'll send you tons of stuff to send to everybody about all of this. Um, volunteering is always great, just sharing our mission. If you're at a table and you hear something, oh, this might make sense to involve ACT in that conversation because they're doing X, Y, and Z with kids, right? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Let me think on a little bit more too. I'll have some better answers. Cindy? I was particularly struck by the statistics about um, students who think about suicide, students who have um, made a plan and students who actually have attempted suicide. As a high school art teacher, there were probably three or four students a year just in the small sampling of the students that I saw mm -hmm. who ended up at Brad Rural Retreat or attempted suicide some way or other. And oftentimes, when they came back to school, arrangements would be made so they could come to the art room as their safe place in the school building where they could just work with their hands and do something creative and get their minds off of poison thinking. And I wondered if any of those kinds of things are in existence in the schools of Bennington. So there are spaces where kids can go. I know um, the prevention coordinator, who uh, is a member of the colleague at the middle school, lost her classroom because they needed to create more space for kids who are uh, just in crisis, right? Um, I love that idea of like, go to the art room. That, I mean, that would have been where I went to high school if I was stressed out, right? Um, we have been seeing an increase in these numbers for a while now but it really blew up during the pandemic, right? Because there's so many external factors. Um, and honestly, kids not getting to go to school, that was really problematic. Um, because school is where they could get something to eat. They knew they were gonna eat, right? They had teachers that care about them. If they needed clean clothes or a shower, they could get that there. Um, and they had mental health support. Um, and then they lost that, and they're stuck at home. So, and I, I'd say that there's a pretty um, good-sized percentage of kids that never showed up on the remote virtual learning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and the poverty rate, too. I mean, that is, I mean, that's a whole other discussion, but it's, it's a huge factor in this. You know, people just not having the skills. Um, yeah. Generational poverty. I don't know, I don't know if you guys have done the, the Bridges course. It's so good. We could talk about that. This is 1.30, so let's turn on our...
So thank you. This was a lot. Like I threw a lot at you all at once. And it's not a doom and gloom. Our kids are creative and lovely, and they're doing the very best that they can. And we are just trying to engage as many community partners that we can. Um, our schools and our community can work closer together to improve the health outcomes for our kids. Thank you. Thank you.